Hey, yo, what's up, what's up, guys? Zaid here with another episode of Zaid's Experience. So today we're going over my jeans, my specific jeans. Now we're finally going into like the comprehensive report. I'm gonna be going over the Found My Fitness documents that I got from Rhonda Patrick's site. I think it's the most comprehensive report. It's very well explained and it kind of really just puts it into perspective for people that have never done this and that just kind of want a little bit more of a comprehensive look without all the craziness of just looking at a massive report. You'll see what I mean. Just come with me and let's check this out, guys. So thanks for tuning in to another episode of Chase Experience, guys. As usual, please go ahead, comment, like, and subscribe. You guys know the deal. Please push that notification bell if you guys wanna see more content such as this. And definitely, definitely push that like button after you've watched this video, if you liked the video. So now let's go into the comprehensive report. So as you guys can see right here in the window, we got a couple of different reports that we can go ahead and take a look at from the Found My Fitness webpage. So this is the Apple E report, the metabolism report, the fitness report, macronutrient report, and the all encompassing comprehensive report. So you can get uh, every single one of these if you don't wanna go through the entire thing, which is the comprehensive report. What you can go ahead and do is just download each one of these individual reports. As I told you before on the previous video, if you haven't checked that out, I'll leave a link to that up here. Basically what the comprehensive report is, it encompasses everything. It encompasses the fitness report, the macronutrients, metabolism, and the Apple E report. What you have to do to get this report is you're gonna have to go into Rhonda Patrick's foundmyfitness.com webpage, upload your 23andMe raw data. It is gonna cost you, I believe, about 25, 35 bucks. I can't remember exactly the amount, but you're gonna get this pretty comprehensive report. And from there on, you're gonna be able to download this report and they consistently get updated, so it's pretty cool. So today we're gonna be going over my report that I've been alluding to for some time, and I'm gonna give you probably a clue as to why the carnivore diet, well, in the specific way that I was doing it, was probably not helping me out as much as it should've, but it, I'm definitely gonna try it out again. I am basically trying it out. I keep on living with the carnivore diet, but I need to tailor it a little bit better to my needs, and this pretty much gives me a very, very in-depth look as to what I need to do in order to make the right changes and head towards the right direction. So let's just check this out. First, um, as opposed to seeing the comprehensive report because it is a little bit overwhelming, uh, we're gonna go over into the Apple E report. And as you can see, there's not a lot here. So I'm kind of happy about that. So basically what the Apple E report is, it basically has to do with how the body processes lipids. So basically if you're somebody that is coded for like an Apple E4 gene um, and that's down regulated, you're, you're a little bit more in the risk of maybe getting like Alzheimer's disease, hypertriglyceridemia, which is a pretty big word. What it helps you, what this gene specifically helps you do, it helps you process lipids a lot better. So let's say you're somebody trying a ketogenic diet and you're just not having success. This could really be something that you guys gotta look out for. And usually if you guys have this gene, you tend to know that you have this gene because it really causes havoc in your body. Usually these types of people have to increase monounsaturated fats. They really have to watch their omega-3s to omega-6 ratio, obviously leaning more to the omega-3s um, and really low lowering down that omega-6, um, which can be a little bit more inflammatory than usual. Lower your LDL levels, and overall just basically decrease saturated fats. It really affects saturated fats in this specific gene. Again, on this report, it'll basically tell you something here in this area, but in my case, I don't have anything noteworthy um, because everything just seems to be fine. As you guys can see right here, this is the gene, the Apple E gene. It seems to be um, working properly. That's what this codes for. Or this, that's what the report shows at least. So I'm very happy with that. <laughs> But now, onto the metabolism report. This one is, but we weren't so lucky on this one, how's that? So the metabolism report encompasses of basically what it says in metabolism, how your body reacts to how it processes foods, carbohydrates, how it doesn't respond, how it should respond, that kind of thing, you know? That's what basically all this is saying. It basically tells you all that. That's what this is encompassing. So 
Learn about polymorphisms that are involved in elevated blood pressure, increased fat deposits, increased LDL cholesterol, um, blah, blah, blah. So basically that's what it's saying. So the first one's gonna be UCP1. So what the hell does that mean? So luckily, um, you can see over here on the side that it gives you the description and so that you guys don't have to read all that. Basically, it is associated with the way your body uses brown fat. UCPC protein is a type of protein that is found in, in the mitochondria of a cell and it basically uses brown adipose tissue as energy. So what does this do? It's basically burning fat internally. So in my particular case, I have the TT alleles, which basically says that my body just doesn't use these as much. They don't, it doesn't use it as energy. So I'm not burning fat at times where normally other people at rest might be burning fat. That can become a little bit of a problem. So it gives you here a study. In a Brazilian population, the TT genotype was associated with obesity when compared to those carrying the C allele. As you guys can see over here, I have the TT. <laughs> so this is a very pronounced gene in my body. In a study of 126 obese and 113 non-obese individuals, those with the TT genotype had BMIs that were on average three kilograms higher than those with the CC genotype. A dose-dependent relationship was observed whereby those with the two copies of the TT allele had higher BMIs than those with only one copy. So BMI, um, body mass index, uh, so people that had the TT allele were directly correlated with a higher um, body weight an average of like three kilograms, which is about six pounds, you know, six, seven pounds. So it's quite a bit, you know? So what are some ways that I can combat this? And this is where this type of study gets really interesting and where I found it very, very cool. And which is why I also found it a lot more superior than the 23andMe report, is it lets you know how to use, how to combat this gene. You guys aren't tied down to your genes. Whatever you see here, I'm not fully tied down. Sure, there's some stuff that's gonna make it a lot harder depending on if you have one gene that is going against the flow of what you're trying to do versus having 10 genes that are going against the flow of what you're trying to do it might get a little bit harder to override those but at the end of the day you guys do have control over your genes and this is what i'm trying to let you guys know because once we go through my list uh you'll see that let's just go through this I'll let you guys know but again what we can do here is it lets you know of a couple of things that you can do to combat this so we can in we can get exposed to a lot more cold what we do is we basically take a lot more cold showers you know be in a room that's a lot colder maybe not use a sweater as much and this will activate the brown fat which will force cells to use this brown fat as energy that's great for us because it's basically burning fat when we get cold so as opposed to carrying this fat around now your body starts to basically use it as energy which makes you leaner and at the same time it gives the cells energy so it's kind of a win-win for the body that I kind of don't have and it gives you like the study, it gives you like a little bit more of the range and everything. Again, I won't go through all these because otherwise this is gonna be a very, very long video. Fish oils really help out due to the EPA and the DHA. And it's basically more of an association because um, it, these reduce inflammation. And at the same time, as you can see here, in studies using mice, fish oil, which is rich in EPA and um, DHEA was reported to induce UCP1 gene expression. So it basically forces the gene to use brown fat, which is why these are very important or can really help out if you have these alleles. Now let's go to the next one. Adipo-Q, A-D-I-P-O-Q. I guess that's how you read it. And then it's G-G, so it's very pronounced. <laughs> Lower adipo adiponectin levels and higher risk of obesity. This one gets a little bit interesting. This basically plays a big role on how we process lipids and glucose and it helps regulate your insulin quite a bit. So it makes it really hard basically to lose weight. As you, uh, there's a basically a study here that I thought was very interesting. It says maintenance of weight loss. So maintenance, there's gotta be a regular maintenance, um, otherwise you gain weight so fast. But let me show you. 
Researchers uh, studying a group of 180 obese Spanish individuals observed that subjects with the GG, which is what I have, genotype exhibited a clinical signs of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome when compared to the AA and AG subjects. Individuals with the GG genotype also had higher O insulin, so we had a higher level of insulin resistance to those people with the AA or the AG allele insulin and triglyceride levels than carriers with the allele. After following a low calorie diet for eight weeks, these unfavorable biomarkers disappeared. However, when re-examined 32 weeks later, the metabolic risk characteristics had returned in the GG individuals with those with the AA alleles were protected from the weight gain. So what does this mean? So basically the people with the GG allele had a higher level of kind of regaining that weight that they had lost versus the people with the AG or AA allele. So it makes it really hard not only to lose weight, but it makes it really hard um, in the sense that you have to be on it in order to not gain weight. And that's what I've told you guys before. If I'm not on it, if I get a little bit off track, just like I told you in my Japan video that I gained um, 12, 15, I gained like 15 pounds. It was ridiculous over a span of 12 days. I, it really, It really does affect you. So then it talks a little bit more about longevity, weight loss and exercise and dietary factors. So it just really goes into the stuff that you really can or cannot do, or well, more than stuff that you should do in order to combat this. There are studies which demonstrate that both fish oils and fiber supplementation are associated with the increase of adiponectin levels, which is basically what I don't have or don't have a lot of. In addition, there is a positive relationship between caffeinated coffee intake and higher adiponectin levels. Hmm. So yeah, morning coffee guys. In contrast, smoking may have a detrimental effect on adiponectin levels and may negate the positive effects of an improved diet. Intermittent fasting. Time-restricted feeding has been shown to increase adiponectin levels in mouse and rat models. I'm not a mouse, I'm not a rat, but I definitely tried intermittent fasting and as you guys have seen from my past results, it has worked. Then also at the top it says weight loss and exercise. Weight loss by lifestyle changes such as diet and exercise are shown to increase adiponectin levels. So basically just do the healthy kind of stuff, you know? But mainly, one of the main main things to take away here, fish oils really help, fiber apparently helps, weight loss and directly correlated to having a healthy exercising life in this sense. And intermittent fasting really, really helps as well because it raises that. So again, these are combos that you can use and I like to think about these as more than just one thing you can do for each one of these things. It's more of a combo situation. You do this in accordance with this and it, it adds up again let's go into another one ACE that's the gene and again GG very very pronounced increased risk of elevated blood pressure and impaired glucose metabolism in response to high saturated fat diet well so high saturated fat diet uh, the carnivore diet isn't always a high saturated fat diet but it can definitely get into high saturated fat territory and this is where I might have messed up eating some more saturated fats than not, like some cheeses maybe on the second time around, maybe adding milk, you know, that kind of thing. It just maybe didn't sit as well as it should have if I was somebody that could process these a little bit better. Um, but yeah, I, I have a hard time um, processing saturated fats that basically, that's one of the things that this gene does. It's associated with the risk of elevated blood pressure and impaired glucose metabolism in response to high saturated fat diet. And it tells you up here, the ACE gene codes for, uh, and to, it, it can get really wordy guys with all this. So. Um, if, if you guys want to go ahead and pause it and go, you guys can go ahead and take a quick read over it. But basically, um, what this tells you is to decrease the overall intake of saturated fat. So again, if I was, tr that's why when I was trying maybe a ketogenic diet for just like two weeks, I was able to see this is not jiving with me, you know? A coconut oil works great for some people. All these other fats just work really, really well for some other people like butter and all this. 
not for me. <laughs> I gotta stay away from them. And I've never had an affinity to eating fat. I've, I've said this before in other videos. I know people like to eat fat, but I've never even really had a taste for it, even for good fat. I've tried some good fat, like from really nice cuts of meat, grass fed, grass finished, you know? It does taste a little better, but I've never gone looking for saturated fat. Like I, I never had that desire. So it's been a, always a little bit of a weird thing for me and maybe that, that that might just be it you know my body telling me hey stay away from that so as you guys can see here decreased saturated fat intake uh, it may be favorable uh, for individuals with this polymorphism to decrease total intake to less than 37% of daily calories and limit the intake of saturated fat. Saturated fat is found in foods such as fatty meats, coconut oil, butter, cheese, and other dairy products. There you go. So let's go to another one. Uh, PNL, PAL, and I won't go through all of these the same way. So this one is not as pronounced, so I won't go into it as much. Slight increase for the risk of fatty liver and alcoholic liver disease. I know it sounds major, but I've gone through it and basically tells you to increase omega-3 fatty acids and decrease any added sugars, you know, the typical thing. Something that we're gonna be seeing over and over and over is this FTO gene. I'm not sure if I have six, six copies, but we're gonna see it six times, guys. And it's very, very pronounced on all of them. Um, there's different variations of it. I know it's RIS 17817449 here. There's different variations of it, and they all code kind of for very similar things. Again, this one, saturated fat may have a negative effect on blood glucose and high insulin levels same thing it doesn't actually give that many recommendations other than avoid saturated fat now we see it again over here fto boom it's a different one as you can see now you have aa it's also very pronounced <laughs> but now look at what it goes to possible 60 percent increase risk for obesity and type 2 diabetes 60 percent increase is really a lot and then the FTO gene, the major genetic risk factor for obesity, codes for fat mass obesity associated protein. Ghrelin, and often called the hunger, uh, the hunger hormone, is produced when the stomach is, an, is empty and is thought to stimulate appetite and desire to eat. The genotype has been associated with the increased risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes due to high production of ghrelin. So it basically lets, tells your body that you're hungry all the time. So basically you're looking for food all the time, which is why it's also very hard hard to get satiated for me. And this has been something that I've always struggled with to keep completely satiated. It's not it's not something that comes very natural to me. To me, I have to cut it off in one way or another. And if I eat a lot of fat, I have to make sure that it's not a lot of saturated fat. So hence, you see the balance, it, 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 it all works synergistically. Just be very aware that this exists. It doesn't give you a lot of help in, in the context here, but sleep has been shown to be very important to regulate this. What else, what else, what else? The AA genotype has also been associated with obesity, particularly in the context of high saturated fat and low polysaturated fat intake. So yeah, this is the other thing. Um, again, lower saturated fats and get a little bit more of the monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, you know, get all this other like stuff that you would find on fish, omegas, again, all these fatty acids that just aren't saturated fat basically. Again, you see FTO once again, boom, really pronounced. Uh, 1.7 fold increase in obesity risk and decrease thermogenesis. The whole UCP1, remember about that, that um, thermogenesis basically had to do with us, with me producing the brown fat or using the brown fat as energy. So this adds on to that. The FTO gene, the major genetic risk factor for obesity codes for fat mass index, for uh, increases for obesity, okay. And gives you the same explanation. So right here it tells you with the whole fish oil thing, uh, fish oil, activates UCP1 and can increase the thermogenesis. Thus, fish oil supplementation may be beneficial for individuals with a CC genotype, is what I have. Again, we can also use the cold thermogenesis to help out. Taking a cold shower will really help, keeping the room cold, being exposed a lot more to cold to force your body into using this brown adipose tissue. Um, exercise is also, it's a given, I think. Let's move on to the next one. FTO again, oh wow. Um, <laughs> 2.76 fold increased risk for obesity 
particularly with saturated fat. Now, are you guys seeing a little bit of a correlation here? FTO gene, the major genetic blah, has been associated with 2.6 increase, blah, and then it gives you again, more of what you shouldn't eat, uh, just saturated fats, and same thing. Then we got another gene, just for the sake of variation, FGF21, and it tells you, it's not as pronounced, but it's slightly pronou uh, pronounced in me, slight preference for sweet over salty foods, slight metabolic risk that might affect dietary suitability. This sucks, because I do like sweets, and it's always been a battle for me, but mainly the one thing that I crave a lot that is, is insane are two things. Dark chocolate, not even sweet, sweet chocolate, dark chocolate. If I see 95% dark chocolate, I'll crave that so bad, guys. My mouth really, right now, it waters. It's the one thing that makes it do that. And the second thing is citrus, particularly oranges and grapefruit and peaches every now and then. And thirdly is berries. And that's it. That's like, that's the kind of sweet stuff I crave. But other than that, I mean, I can basically block everything, but I know I have to keep away, maybe not as much from those, but I like to keep away from stuff that has that, like, you know, breads that have orange, breads that have chocolates, breads that have um, that kind of stuff. You know, carbs in combination with these, I really, really have to like struggle with my inner demons to kind of just fight this out. So yeah, I do have a slight preference for the sweets, guys. Again, let's move on. It doesn't tell you how to combat that, but it does tell you the suitability for a ketogenic diet, a study with the FG, uh, uh, knockout mice missing the FG, missing this gene, showed that these animals did not respond well when fed a ketogenic diet. As I told you guys, not everybody responds well to a ketogenic diet. It really depends on who you are. And I think these studies, that's why I really like the study. It tells you a couple of things. And at the same time, it is not a set thing, like a one size fits all. Like we gotta stop thinking about it this way. That's why I do like the carnivore diet, but I like to make the tweaks so that I can make it work for me. And I know a lot of people say, that's not what a carnivore diet is. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is what works for me. And I think it should matter the same to you. So for those people that try to tell you, you know, that's not a carnivore diet, whatever. Tailor it to yourself and you can see the results or you will see the results over a long period of time if you're smart about it, if you self-quantify, if you just check these things and make it so that you are the one that gets benefited and not the people that are saying, oh, this or this or that. So yeah, exercise is gonna help. Cold exposure, we're seeing a pattern here. FTO, boom. <laughs> AA, again, very pronounced, increase risk for obesity, high protein diet suitability. So I was very shocked when I saw this, but at the same time, I wasn't. I've always liked to eat a lot of protein ever since I was a very young kid. And I think that's why I was always very muscular and I was always able to hold on to muscle, no problem. My body just wanted to do that. And it still does. Um, I have no problem eating a high, um, high protein diet. The problem is uh, maybe coupling it with, say, carbs. And that's where the struggle can, can be or it can happen, you know? Here basically just tells you, you know, you have a higher suitability for high protein diet, you know? Just again, being mindful that if we are gonna be consuming proteins, um, maybe start aiming a little bit for leaner cuts of meat. And if we are gonna be aiming for leaner cuts of meat, maybe start adding the fattier ones with them being like something like fish, you know? Using the SMASH acronym, like something that comes out, sardines, mackerel, anchovies, salmon, and something else, like in herring, I can't, yeah, herring I think is the other one. I probably messed that up quite a bit. That's definitely a way to, to help all this out. Okay. PGC, um, increased cardiorespiratory fitness. This is finally something in my favor. I've always told you guys that I've had a massive output when it came to endurance sports. Endurance sports have always been my forte. Even though I've, I've, I've been pretty strong, I'm stronger than, than a lot of guys my size, but I also know some guys that are dwarves and are just insanely powerful. But all that aside, I've always had some massive, cardio and I don't know why like I, I have friends that I smoke out all the time that are fit I'm talking shredded and I was always super perplexed and when I saw this gene it just really kind of 
put things into perspective. So yay, one for me. I should have coded this actually not pink. I should have put it like blue and green. This is this is one of the happy jeans for me. So yay. And again, very, very pronounced in me. And I've always did like cardio stuff. Again, that's why I was able to run the seven miles a day. I know my dad gave me this gene because my dad is crazy. Right now he's 55. He, I, I can't sit, I can't get him to sit down. My grandpa was the exact same way. So in that regard, I think I'm, I'm pretty good. Like I, I can work all day. I can like, I can just be a workhorse and somehow I survive and I'm just like, okay, let's do it all over again tomorrow. No problem. Increased cardiorespiratory fitness. It really helps out with anything that has to do with cardio or just, I think, endurance, <laughs> mainly. There's another gene, slight increased risk for type two diabetes, polyunsaturated fat, uh, keep on going. This is the same thing. Uh, GG, T TFAP2B. Again, very pronounced, increased risk for uh, increased risk for obesity and large waist circumference alters response to diet. So this report after a while really starts to push on using maybe a more Mediterranean diet, which is basically more polyunsaturated fats, more fish, lower red meats, that kind of thing. But I think if we use a good amount of lean red meats in combination with some fish oils, um, we can keep a good carnivore diet. And PPM1, okay. Slight elevated circulating B BCAAs and risk for type two diabetes, high fat, again, high saturated fat, sorry. High, high fat diet. So yeah, lower the fat, basically. Uh, FADS1, slight increase in inflammation in conjunction with high thialinic acid, omega-6. Again, lower the omega-6 ratio, lower the omega-6 and bring the omega-3 ratios up. That way you can, you know, have a little bit more balance than that. Saturated fats, bring them down. GIPR, this is very pronounced as well. Increased risk for obesity, go figure. And another FTO gene at the very, very bottom. Very pronounced again. Increased risk for of obesity and fiber may help with abdominal obesity. I was very perplexed with this because I've taken fiber before on its own and I don't think it ever really made a difference other than it just made me poop a lot but I never saw uh, actual increase in fat loss. So this one I'm gonna have to take with a grain of salt. And since I've been in the carnivore diet, that kind of really, you know, turns all the fiber theory uh, on its head. So I will potentially try it out in the future, but as of right now, I'm gonna stick to something a little bit different. But yeah, as you guys can see, then you have the less noteworthy stuff. Uh, again, these are just basically genes that are just kind of normal in the general population. And I think it's kind of cool that they included these. Again, I don't want to go through all these. I guess they're just kind of not as important as the top one. But now let's go into the fitness report. And I know this is getting lengthy. Again, this is this will be fairly quicker than the other one. The metabolism report was the main one that I wanted to go over. SLC3088. <laughs> this is the snippet involved and everything. Increased risk for type 2 diabetes related to zinc transport, susceptibility, and DOMS. So I have always had a, a history of not recovering fast enough. And what this kind of feels like is like I basically do have delayed on muscle soreness all the time. So what this basically is telling me is that maybe I should up my zinc intake. Zinc is a trace element involved in a variety of cellular processes, for example, serving as a cofactor in numerous enzymes as well as its role on insulin secretion and storage. So very, very important for me to up my zinc intake. Okay, so it just tells you delayed on muscle soreness and that you can basically benefit from taking intaking zinc. And then these again are a little bit, not as much of a problem for me. I really am interested in the ones that are very, very pronounced in me. Cole 5A1, slight increased risk for Achilles tendinopathy. So just basically gotta be aware that I'm taking enough magnesium in, that I'm getting my zinc in, you know, that I'm recovering because of that zinc deficiency, I tend to lack recovery a lot faster than most people. So just making sure that I get enough zinc into my diet will help out with this particular gene as well. So it's a combo, guys. Begfa. 
<laughs> that's uh, that's a better way of reading these. Slight improve endurance capacity again. CG. It's not as pronounced, but I can de I definitely know that the endurance capacity is there. Improve adaptation to aerobic training. <laughs> I can, I can run for days, guys, and it, and it feels great, actually. ADRB2, slight increase in endurance capacity. Again, another gene. Um, and then less noteworthy, normal ability to lose weight. It says here and everything, but I highly doubt it after the whole saturated fat thing. And then this is the last report. We're not gonna go over the comprehensive report, even though it does have a couple of other things, but let me just show you the macronutrient report. This report is focused on snippets that are related to bioavailability and metabolism of micronutrients, which include essential vitamins, minerals, fatty acids, amino acids that humans must obtain for their diet since they do not produce them. What I do or do not need in regards to vitamins, omegas, that kind of thing, you know, folic acid, vitamin B12, omega-3s, and all that iron, you know. It does tell me the FUT2 gene, that's the one in, in the snippet involved, is this one, and it's very pronounced. Associated with higher vitamin B12 levels and resistance to non-virus infection, non-viral infections. So I do have a harder time as I've, sh I've told you guys before. I don't get sick as much. My girlfriend always comes in sick because she works with kids and for some reason I never ever get sick. Like if I ever, if I get sick, I get sick maybe once every two years now. The trend's been going up actually, which I'm happy because that's been telling me that I, I am doing something right. So I was very happy with that. Microbiome, it also tells you, as well as diet, one of the factors that can determine the composition of a microbiome is the host genotype. Non-secretors, AA, which is basically what I have, do not express histoblood blood group antigens in the essential mucus where microorganisms can bind. So this can also be beneficial because certain helpful microbes might not bind to it, but at the same time, it kind of does make you immune to a lot of um, non-viral infections. So, you know, kind of a double-edged sword because it can also kind of decrease, uh, just as it says here, non-secretors had uh, reduced diversity, richness, and abundance of bifidobacteria as compared to secretors, which is why probably kefir helped me out so much. It brought in so much more bacteria, which helped me just plow through carbs when I was trying out carbs and right after I had my kefir that I made at home or kefir, I'm never gonna get it right. It just felt so different. It felt like if my stomach would get immediately bloated, I would drink the kefir and immediately, like five minutes after, it just felt like it, it did something completely different. And after a while, I, I felt like I didn't need to drink it as much but it's it's nice to know that I have that as a tool that I can come back to all the time if I do want to have a cheat meal every now and then. And plus, these kinds of bacteria stay in your gut. I think kefir is really, really good in that sense and that it stays in your body for a longer period of time versus maybe yogurt, which just kind of goes through you and, you know, a lot less bacteria. Again, there's another one over here, a slight increased risk of Crohn's disease associated with impaired vitamin C transport. Again, I'm not super worried about that. It's not as pronounced. MTRR, increased risk for hypo, <laughs> hyperhomeocystemia and altered choline metabolism. And this is where I told you guys that I know that when I eat eggs, I feel great. So I really have to check my choline intake. Eggs are a great way to find choline. Liver is another great way to find choline, and there's a couple of other things. Actually, chocolate um, has a high amount of choline, which is great. Dark chocolate has uh, high amounts of choline, so I really do like chocolate, and maybe that's one of the reasons why I crave it, and it does make me feel really good, surprisingly. So that's basically what this saying. Dietary choline intake. Choline is found in food such as eggs, meat, fish, and cruciferous vegetables. Strict vegetarians may need to pay special attention to meeting their choline needs, and once I feel like when when I don't eat enough egg or I don't eat enough red meat, which is why I prefer, I guess, red meat over chicken, I do feel like I will have energy, I will be able to talk to you guys, but I'll feel like I'm gone, like I'm mentally gone, I'm just like eh. You'll find in a lot of focus supplements that you'll find choline in high amounts. I'm talking about like 300 to 600 milligrams, and especially if it's a high, 
a quality supplement, you'll find it in higher dosages. But yeah, choline really helps me focus. It really helps me be here, remember stuff. It just helps out so much. Biotine and reduction in homocysteine, you know, vitamin B12 and B2, cobalamin and riboflavin, those are the two vitamins. Uh, balance is thought to be an important factor in people with this polymorphism when vitamin B12 status was low, those with the G allele had a higher homocysteine levels and those with the AA genotype individuals susceptible to low vitamin B12 status include older adults, including older adults, those with digestive issues, Crohn's, colitis, post-gastric bypass patients, and those following vegan diets. TMAO may enhance plate, platelet regeneration, clotting, and increase heart disease risk so there's got to be a fine balance in how much I intake and how much I not take you know and then we got the fats one uh, associated with inter intermediate phospholipid um, choline levels a little bit lower levels or it's not as pronounced in me as in other people again it talks about the same thing of, of choline and everything and then we got this one genetic risk for vitamin D deficiency um, take a little bit more vitamin D, that's all it's saying. Again, this one as well, it's saying that I don't convert it as well and what are the steps that I should um, worry about, but basically at the end of the day, it's telling me to take a little bit more vitamin D than, than most people. Same thing, uh, vitamin D binding protein. So I do take vitamin D on the side. I take about 5,000 I, I use, and that definitely helps out. GSTP1, supplementing with vitamin E may be har harmful. Try to keep that low. Whenever you do buy a vitamin D supplement, usually it comes with vitamin K, and that really does help. Slight increase in serum calcium. We got another one over here. Slight increase in serum calcium levels, possibly associated with lower bone mineral density. Again, we can go over all this again and less noteworthy, higher vitamin B12 levels. So, But yeah, those that was kind of like the gist of it. So what I got from all this, in order for me to lose fat, I gotta decrease my saturated fats in and like quite a bit, like just like almost kind of, almost eliminate the crap out of them. <laughs> really start using a couple of tools such as cold exposure, things that are gonna help keep my insulin at a more homeostatic level. I think that's really, really gonna help taking a lot more polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats, so eating a lot more fish, uh, eating a lot more eggs, that's really gonna help out as well. Even though eggs have a higher saturated fat intake as well, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about eggs if they're higher quality because they do have a really good amount of omega-3 or they tend to have way more omega-3, especially if they're pasture raised. Again, the, the acronym SMASH really helps out with all of that. Using the cold a lot more, you know, to burn fat, that's really, really gonna help me out. And I think that's something that I haven't used enough of. I've used some of it, but I'm definitely gonna start to take more cold showers. I'm gonna make it a regular. That way I can see and start tracking the progress of what that's gonna do to my body, which I'm super, super interested. So I'm gonna start taking more cold showers, just be cold in general. And hopefully we can get that brown fat mobilizing. We can get those cells to start using that brown fat as energy. You know, a lot of good takeaways from all this, and that's why I really liked this report from Rhonda Patrick. It, it, it gives you more than just the report itself. Like, you have this, you're screwed. If you wanna read more on it, and then you read this paper that's like complete gibberish or not gibberish, but it's really hard to digest, and it gets very wordy, and after a while, I mean, you, you only have so much brain power, you know? really make sure I'm getting my choline in. That's gonna be another thing that I'm gonna be very worried about. I'm getting my vitamin D. That's also something that I'm gonna be very worried about getting in. So this, these are all things that I uh, that I've started to incorporate slowly. And this is why I'm saying that I can definitely optimize my carnivore diet and make it tailored to me. Eating organ meats is definitely gonna help out. Eating eggs, eating fish, that's definitely gonna help out. But knowing that I have to lower the saturated fats, I think is a game changer for me. If you guys stuck around to the end of this video, I really, really do appreciate it, guys. Thanks for joining me in another episode of Sage Experience. Please go ahead and comment, like, and subscribe. You guys know the deal. Push that notification bell if you haven't already done so. And definitely, definitely push that like button. Maybe even help hit the little bell icon. That way you guys get notified every time I come up with a video such as this. But yeah, I would have gone over the comprehensive report if you guys wanted me to go over the comprehensive report, which does have a couple of things here or there that are extra. But again, I try to keep this as short as possible. 
I did not succeed. <laughs> but that's what editing is for. But in any case, guys, that is enough for today. Zay out. Peace.